<laughs> I'd like to conduct a very simple exercise with everyone here today. Please turn to the person next to you, preferably someone you didn't meet before, shake their hand and say hello. And please remember to smile. <laughs> Look at those smiles. <laughs> so, in those five seconds, we just created up to 100 new connections, which, with more time, could lead to 100 new stories, 100 new ideas, and 100 new friendships. Now, wouldn't it be great if life were that simple? If we could make new human connections and share our biggest ideas and passions just like that? I know some people can, but of course, it's not always that easy. We may feel embarrassed or nervous, or we might not be in the right situation. And I believe that today, it's easier than ever before to ignore the people around us. And these kinds of spontaneous encounters are becoming perhaps less and less part of our daily lives. Commuting by train, I've got my headphones. If I'm waiting for a friend, I have my smartphone. If I'm waiting at the airport for a flight, I have my laptop. We increasingly construct these digital shells and become more and more immersed into our own worlds. And as a result, we often block off the people and the world around us. Now, I believe that as we become more and more boxed into our own worlds, we're missing a big opportunity. By avoiding strangers, by avoiding the unknown, we've come to know less about ourselves and about the world in which we live. Now, in my last year of university, I was having a personal crisis. I was about to graduate, I had no job lined up, and I had no idea what I'd be doing with my life. And then one day, something happened. I was in bed after a late night, and I was suddenly awoken by a phone call. I picked up to hear my mother's voice, who is Japanese and whose family is from here in Sendai originally. And she was in a state of panic. She said, Robin, there's been a big earthquake. And I remember vividly switching on the TV and seeing the horrific images of what had happened that day. And that day was March 11, 2011, the day of the Great East Japan earthquake. A few weeks later, I was on a flight back to Japan. And after reuniting with my loved ones, I spent several months in some of the worst affected areas along the coast. And looking back, do you know what I remember seeing? I saw thousands upon thousands of strangers helping strangers. And what was really interesting was it wasn't just people from all over Japan, it was people from all over the world who were here, standing side by side with the people of Tohoku to build back. And that was an incredibly formative experience for me on my personal journey. And since then, for the past eight years, I've been working with natural disasters, both here in Japan and around the world. And as I went from one disaster zone to the next, I'd see the same phenomenon again and again. Complete strangers helping one another. But we humans, with time, tend to forget about people and places affected by crisis. We move on with our lives, it's, it's human nature. But what happens when the media coverage stops, when the help stops coming, and as people continue to rebuild their lives, years and years after, the tragedy occurs. This is what is often left undocumented in the history books, and this is really what I wanted to know. So I decided to seek the answer here in Tohoku, where it all began for me and the land of my ancestors. So around the same time I was asking myself these questions, I heard about this new walking trail called the Michinoku Coastal Trail. Now, this was designed by the government of Japan to bring in people from, again, all over the world to see the sights, to taste the food, to experience the culture of Tohoku, and also to hear the stories of the disaster. The walking trail itself runs from Hachinohe in Aomori all the way down to Soma City in Fukushima for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. Now, as soon as I heard about this, I knew I had to walk in. <laughs> Because not only was Tohoku such an important place for me, but it was also 
the fact that I was an outdoors lover from the age of three years old. So I made the decision to walk from the north to the south in one month, about 600 kilometers, by myself. And as I told more and more friends, I got more reactions saying, Robin, you're crazy. Why would you walk 600 kilometers in summer by yourself? <laughs> Fair questions. <laughs> But to me, walking, unlike cycling or taking the train or the bus, is the most intimate way to experience a place and its people. It forces you to slow down and take in every single detail of your surroundings. It forces you to stop and say hello and have a cup of tea. It can be painfully slow, but it's the, the mode of transport I decided to take. So when the time came, I made my way to the, the north and the head of the trail. And as I was overlooking the ocean, this is the first scene that I saw. And this was the perfect taster of what was to come, because over the coming weeks, I would see scenes like this. And I'd see this idyllic blue ocean like this. And I would see dramatic cliffs like this. And I kept discovering more and more of these natural wonders that I never knew existed. And from the very first day, I also had so many encounters with local people. People tell me that the Japanese are very shy, but I found the exact opposite. People would come up to me out of the blue, they start poking my bag and asking, where are you going? What are you doing? You know, who are you? <laughs> and some of these encounters just led to epic, epic interactions. Like this man, who bought me yakitori on the street. <laughs> and I was even invited to learn about the art of ramen with this man. And I was even recruited to dress up as a, a life-sized sea creature and sell seafood to local people as well. Don't ask me what's going on with this costume here, I have no idea. <laughs> and all of this made me realize that, yes, food and scenery is important, but what really makes a place unique are interactions with people. In other words, people make places. And today I'd like to share just two encounters with you out of the hundreds that I had that really left a deep impression on me. So one afternoon I was completely lost and I stumbled into this front garden of a big house alone on a hill. And as I was looking at my map, I looked up at the window and I saw this man looking down at me. And our eyes met and I thought for a second, he's going to call the police. Because <laughs> there I was, a foreign looking man with a big backpack, looking terrible, I hadn't showered in about three days. But luckily, he opened the window and he waved me in. So we went in his, into his living room, we had a cup of tea, and we sat around in his beautiful wooden table. And as I complimented him on his home, he told me that his old one had been washed away by the tsunami. And as I said, I was so sorry to hear about this. He looked me in the eye and he said, you won't believe this, but this is the second time I've lost my home. And he went on to explain how in 1960, his family home had been washed away by another big tsunami. And back then, there was no warning. It just came and took everything away. And having heard his story, I asked him, what keeps you here by the coast when you've been through so many traumatic events? And he explained to me very matter-of-factly, his family, as fishermen, had lived off the ocean for generations. Their family had a very deep, profound respect and connection with it. And he looked at me and said, we will continue. We are people of the ocean, and we will rebuild and carry on. And hearing his story taught me so much about human resilience, about vulnerability, but also about the complex relationship between human societies and the natural world which is something so fundamental to life on Earth. It also made me realize that something that seems so simple on the surface is often much more complicated yeah. if we just sit down and listen. 
Another one of my favorite encounters was one day when I was sleeping. I was about to sleep outside of a public bathhouse, as you do, <laughs> and I got a tap on the shoulder. I turned around and I saw these two grinning at me, and they were like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and I said, "I'm about to sleep here." And they were like, "Damn it, sure, damn it, sure. It's too cold. It's too cold." It was 35 degrees, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, they kindly invited me back to their home, and as we sat around their table, you know, we had sembe, rice crackers, and we had tea, and we had this just incredible evening talking about politics, romance, poetry, and you know, everything in between. And as the night was winding down, I asked them, "Why did you come and talk to me? You had no idea who I was." And one of them, after a brief pause, said to me that during the tsunami they lost everything. They lost their home. They lost family members, and it was a very difficult time. But seeing people from all over Japan and all over the world in their town, people who had never even heard of the name of the town, were there to rebuild with them, and that left a very deep impression on them. And she said to me that our family has been on the receiving end of so much kindness. And now I just try and pay it forward, even in a small way. And her story really taught me so much about ongaishi, as we say in Japanese, the way of the act of giving forward or giving back to someone something. And it made me realize that the act of one person, one good deed, can go on and on and impact others' lives in ways that you can never imagine. Now these are just two encounters that I had out of hundreds. And each one taught me something new about the world, challenged my assumptions, and provided some valuable insight. Well, what did I learn through all of this? This whole 600-kilometer journey, this walk, and talking to so many people. Firstly, I learned that a little crazy idea can sometimes become something much bigger than you ever expected. In 2017, I became one of the first people to start walking the trail and writing about it in English, and I was honestly overwhelmed at the level of interest and support from people from all over the world. And even today, I receive emails and messages from people saying that they have decided to make the journey themselves after seeing the photos and the stories and the videos that I shared from my journey. And just being a small part of that, of helping other people to discover Tohoku for themselves, is an incredibly humbling feeling. But most importantly, I learned the power of talking and listening to strangers. Hearing one person's story is a hundred times more powerful than reading a news report, than looking through social media, than flicking through headlines. If we really want to understand the world around us, We have to go to the people at the center of the story, and we have to listen. During my journey, I opened myself up to so many strangers who taught me about resilience, about human vulnerability, about kindness. I could never have had these insights without those encounters. And I believe that if we can just be more genuinely open with each other, even complete strangers, then we can create even more new ideas. Can create new inspiration, and we can ultimately change the world even just a little bit. But when you think about it, these kinds of interactions don't have to happen on just a 600-kilometer walk in rural Japan. They can happen any time, anywhere. They can happen on the bus, in a cafe. They can even happen in this very room. So I ask you: the next time you have an opportunity, and if you feel safe and comfortable. Consider striking up a conversation with a complete stranger, because you never know what unexpected lesson you might gain, and how your life trajectory might change. Each and every stranger has a story; it's just waiting to be discovered. Thank you. <laughs>